seven pieces of statewide legislation we've passed in the last 12 years, four to reduce the harms associated with uh, overdose, three to reduce the harms associated with syringe criminalization. Data nerds, of course I brought data for you. This is what we do. We're going to talk about where we're at and where we're going, and we're going to talk about this shitty-ass bill that just passed. Okay. Harm reduction reduces the harms associated with X. Today we're talking in relation to drug use. How we use lots of forms every day in every way? Sand in a playground, helmets when riding a bicycle, designated drivers reduces the harms associated with your drunkenness. We've got prevention over here, we have treatment over here, we have the criminalization of drug users here. All I'm going to talk about today is the life in the middle. In a magical world, there'd be no drugs, although drugs are great. Uh, but we live here, and there's one safe thing that folks can do today. And I think many of us can agree that if stigma, shame, and incarceration worked with drug use, we'd have wrapped this puppy up years ago. All that's done is drive use underground, where people have gotten preventable chronic diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C, and diet of overdose, so we're doing something different. And quite frankly, harm reduction means we're rooting for you. How can we support you for a healthier and safer you today? Harm reduction is no place for ego. It's a place to forget what you think you know and set aside your opinion so that when you meet people where they're at, you can take the time to ask them where they want to go. How can I support you? You know we're not parole and probation, right? You know what you should do? What the fuck do I know about you? You know you better than anybody else in the entire world. How can I support you for a healthier and safer you today? The war on drug users has been incredibly racist and classist since forever, but especially since June of 1971, when the war on drug users was declared. We also know right about that time the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency or Administration, was created. Last year, the DEA had a $3.2 billion budget and over 9,000 employees. They cannot arrest their way to drug use. Crack was first developed and introduced in the 80s. Reagan signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, making mandatory minimum penalties for drug offenses. Then, of course, we have the 1995 Crime Bill, which contributes, contributes and contributed to mass incarceration. We have had some reduction in the crack powder sentencing, sentencing disparity. It used to be 100 to 1, now it's 18 to 1. And even under the former administration, they did call it an opioid epidemic. We don't call it that. It's an overdose crisis. It's a fentanyl overdose crisis and it's a polydrug overdose crisis, meaning usually three or more drugs are on board uh, if people die of an overdose. There's a common misconception that people who inject don't care about their health. They actually do. Uh, we have black tar heroin in Colorado for only a little longer, which is difficult to snort and expensive to smoke, so you almost have to exclusively inject it. The average heroin injector injects three to five times a day. The average meth injector once or twice a day. The average cocaine injector 12 to 15 times a day. I want to make sure that folks have new sterile equipment every single time to prevent and eliminate the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. Anytime you break your skin, you're at risk of infection. One swipe of an alcohol pad will keep folks out of the emergency department for costly skin tissue infections. Colorado Hospital Association says they pay out about $6,000 a day for IV antibiotics with an average stay of five days that can be completely prevented with an alcohol pad that costs less than a penny. I should have said earlier, I speak quickly, it's kind of my thing. Okay. There's more than 11 million people who inject drugs in the United States. That's an undercount. Stigma and shame have been very clear. Don't tell anyone unless you're in a syringe access program. 1.4 million people who inject are living with HIV. 5.6 million are living with hepatitis C. 1.2 million are living with both HIV and hepatitis C. And I want to be really clear, are completely preventable with access to sterile supplies such as cookers, cups, tourniquets. Dr. Chanel, yes. PWID. People who inject drugs. Okay, thank you. Yes. So why does somebody inject, right? Nobody just wakes up and says, today's the day I'm going to start injecting. It's going to be magical, right? Marty and I are hanging out, sharing a bag of cocaine for the ish. He snorts his half up. I only need a little bit to inject with. He's going to look at me, and he's going to say, that looks like a bigger, better high, more economical, and to show him how. So we talk about not modeling in front of non-injectors so you don't even get asked, right? So if everybody in the room is snorting, you snort too. Uh, learning initially is more economical. Feeling like the odd one out. I recently got on Facebook. I know all about that. <laughs> Hearing people talk about the rush and other benefits and then seeing someone inject. Fun facts about syringe access programs. They're currently happening in 35 states and 87 countries. We are not being revolutionary. We just caught up with Good Public Health in 2010. It reduces injection-related diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C, endocarditis, necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis. There's no bigger health nerds in the world than healthcare providers and people who inject drugs. They have a very tumultuous relationship, and we can talk about that, so we try to bridge that access. But they're big old health nerds, I can assure you. 
It improves public safety. The state health department tells people to put used syringes in a coffee can, wrap them in duct tape, and put them in the dumpster. Nobody feels good about that. Ours are incinerated. We know that one third of law enforcement officers nationally will be pricked by a syringe at some point in their career. Two thirds of that one third will be pricked multiple times. It's actually one in five with Denver Police Department. We want to reduce needle stick injuries and promote proper disposal. We want the folks coming across town with those used syringes. So before law enforcement pats me down and asks if I have anything sharp, and they always do, and I say yes and they don't get pricked, I don't get charged, right? We are running about an 87% disposal rate, which is one of the highest in the nation. So for every 10 pack we give out, we get 8.7 back. Taxpayer money savings, the average person is living 25 plus years with HIV. It's a manageable and chronic disease, however, it doesn't have to be so. My needles cost me time. And evidence-based, there's not many more rigorously tested best practices to treat chaotic and non-chaotic drug use as a health issue and not a moral issue. And I won't talk about addiction tonight because I don't talk about addiction. It's chaotic and non-chaotic, problematic and non-problematic. And you could be a managed drug user and have managed use with heroin, cocaine, um, meth, just like you can for alcohol. Fentanyl. Okay, babes. So fentanyl <laughs> is here. Colorado was like, we're too cute. And you're like, you're not too cute, Colorado. So it started on the East Coast in 2014. It's been in Colorado since about 2018. It's a strong synthetic opioid that's been used in clinical settings. You ever heard of a fentanyl patch, right? Like, it's possible. So fentanyl is partly responsible for the current overdose crisis in the U.S., combined with the lack of resources and the criminalization of people who use drugs. Heroin is harder to access. Heroin's almost gone in Colorado due to climate change and lack of poppy cultivation. Much like in 1920s alcohol prohibition, they weren't brewing cases of beer. They were making cheap, hard liquor in a bathtub. That's exactly what's going on now. You don't need farmlands and farmers when you can go ahead and make a synthetic opioid in a lab called fentanyl. Prohibition, criminalization, and the drug market have brought us fentanyl, and they're gonna bring us the next synthetic opioid. Fentanyl's moving through the streets, babe, so there's three, kind of, it's like three tier. First, we're finding it in heroin, meth, and cocaine. Then second, it's being pressed into blue pills. They're called the blues. They have a little fentanyl, a lot of fentanyl, or no fentanyl in there. My folks who are opioid users don't wanna be in withdrawal. It's physically painful, the flu times a thousand. So they're purchasing five, and they're using five to 20 pills per day because it's not a safe supply, right? It's unpredictable, so you never know how much it is. So five to 20 a day. They're actually smoking it. They're feeling much better about smoking than injecting. Anytime you break your skin, you're at risk of infection. Smoking is stigma reduction over injecting. You know, smokers think they're better than injectors. People who drink think they're better than everybody, right? You don't have to find veins, things like that. So there are a lot of benefits for folks using fentanyl. One of the problems is, thanks for asking, is if I was a maintenance heroin user, I would not expect to be in withdrawal for four to six hours, which is physically painful, the flu times a thousand. With fentanyl, you're in withdrawal after an hour and a half or two hours, so it's shorter acting, which is why a lot of folks don't even, aren't able even to stay in the shelters because you wake up in the middle of the night in withdrawal. And if you've ever smelled somebody smoking fentanyl and smoking those pills, it smells like an electrical fire. I wish it smelled like lavender or lilacs, but the cartel never calls. Okay. So there, are, there is a lot of fentanyl madness out there, uh, like much like reefer madness. I think that the drug wars communications director has done an excellent job in Colorado freaking people out about fentanyl and giving out a lot of misinformation, right? So w people who don't know anything about people who use drugs think they know everything about people who use drugs. Find uh, your current legislator at the Capitol, right? Um, so we have fentanyl and fentanyl analogs are not naloxone resistant. You can use naloxone or Narcan. It is an opioid. You cannot overdose simply by touching powdered fentanyl. Perhaps you've seen some news stories where it only seems to happen to first responders, right? It's always been a panic attack. You cannot overdose by touching powdered fentanyl. Ohio had this wild story where it was coming through the ducts. That doesn't happen either. It's not in the air. So much so that the American College of Medical Toxicology and the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology, and I don't know how often they are, they have a joint statement, but they came out with a joint statement like, babe, it's not real. So like, we need to be really careful when we're looking at the media and what they're trying to feed us, because when you have this fentanyl madness out there, it's much easier for legislators to pass bad legislation, and we'll definitely talk about the bad legislation they passed this year, but it makes it much easier for everybody to think, well, I certainly don't want it in the air, Feel free to ask questions along the way. Okay, data nerds, this one's for you. 
So we've been an agency for 20 years. We've only had the ability to change syringes for the last 10. So we've had over 12,000 folks sign up with us. We see between 50 and 125 people per morning being proactive about their health. No one's mandated to be there, thankfully. Um, we are uh, in our fourth location. I don't own a building. I've got to get there soon. We're on the southeast corner of 8th and Lincoln in the old Le Centro, which is a French restaurant. Come over for a tour. We'll make it happen. At the end, you'll get mussels and pomfrets. Um, we've done 167,179 syringe access episodes. That's every single time folks were engaging with folks, creating a relationship where they can dispose properly of used syringes, access to sterile syringes, and offered referrals. Do you want to talk to staff today about medicated moment, mental health, substance use treatment, naloxone, health education classes, HIV, Hep C testing, fentanyl testing strips, PrEP? Over 100,000 times they said yes, right? We want to connect them right away. What are my trickiest referrals in town? Substance use treatment and mental health support. We have access to naloxone or Narcan. It's safe and highly effective. Paramedics and emergency departments have been using it for over 40 years, which is really great if overdoses happen around paramedics or emergency departments. So it's important to in the, peop in, uh, the hands of people who use drugs first and foremost, because they're the true first responders in this overdose crisis. And then third parties, people around people at risk of an opioid overdose. Mothers, homeless service providers, me, you, do you walk on earth? You should have access. I'm gonna train you today too, just for a free gift with purchase. So we've trained over 5,800 folks. Oh, Betsy, yes, thank you. Uh, we're currently at 3,190 lives saved to date. We know that because they come back to us, they tell us about it, we fill out a form, we high five them. So last year alone, of the reversals our folks did, they called 911 a third of the time. I don't, when we recognize and respond to an overdose at my agency, I don't call 911 anymore. It's not cop drama, it's paramedic drama. And it's incredibly problematic because I'm trying to call for a medical issue and they get really fussy and I'm not here for that. Wait, can you explain what you mean by that? Like, yes. They send the cops instead of the paramedics? No, they send the paramedics. I, I, you would think I would have cop drama if the cops came. Cops aren't my problem when I call in an overdose, paramedics are my problem. So we've made it so that every time we reverse an overdose, I don't call 911 anymore. Because yeah. of paramedics, not because of cops. But what's the, but what's the problem? Like, why they're are, fussy. Why? Is there a paramedic in the room? They take their time. They're mean. <laughs> they're meansies. Because they don't understand what's really They don't going understand. On. They're on the front lines and they're burnt out, and we totally get that, and I want to be supportive to that. I'm also on the front lines. But they also come in and they have a lot of questions and they also are very upset about somebody overdosing. Most paramedics are trained when they give out Narcan is to tie somebody down. They also give a lot of it. You know, we give out the kind of gentler dose for people to have four milligrams. They push it really hard. If you push it really hard, it knocks the opioid off the, uh, the receptor and puts people in physical withdrawal, which is painful, the flu times a thousand, to show them. That's how you'll learn. But all that does is the next time there's an overdose, you make sure you don't call 911. Thank you, I'm glad you brought that up. And do you find well, this that, is on live feed. Do you find that with both public paramedics, like fire paramedics versus say private paramedics? Uh, I find that with Denver Health and with Denver Fire. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Denver Fire, I, you know, I can, we do a lot of things, one of the things we do is tours and presentations. We lure folks in to see what we are and what we aren't. There's no good media representation of a syringe access program. I can get cops to tour every afternoon if I wanted to. I cannot get paramedics and I cannot get fire in there. But every time I've had to call 911, then they come and then you get, you know, you get, you get nine fire, you know, two are doing something, the other seven are standing around. They're like, I have no idea we had a syringe exchange in town. I'm like, hello, my name is Lisa. We need to talk about this. Because in urban areas, fire's first. So while 204 law enforcement departments in the state carry Narcan, fire and paramedics are doing most of the reversals. And a lot of times, paramedics don't like it that lay people have access to naloxone. They think they're the only ones that can do so. Well, we're in the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in. And when they're fussy right on the front lines, I need to make sure that my folks have access. But so much so that I'm a provider of the largest syringe access program in the state, and I don't feel comfortable calling 911. That's weird. Okay, so drugs injected most in the past 30 days. We're about 50-50 at heroin and meth injected most. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of poly drug use. We have a lot of folks that use meth who are unhoused, who do so in the winter, so they can walk around the city and not lay down and freeze to death. 
So using meth in our community is oftentimes a survival method. For example, that's going to be what people are using on Friday night because a lot of folks have thrown away most of their stuff, right, thinking that we're in these 80 to 90 degrees, and now they're going to be walking around town. 29% uh, of participants surveyed had smoked crack in the past year. 85% of participants surveyed had smoked meth in the past year. So we also give out safer smoking kits. I want to make sure that folks have the tools they need for healthier and safer them so we can create that relationship, right? We want smoking as risk reduction over injecting. And at a time of COVID, I want to make sure they're not sharing. We also have kits for folks that smoke fentanyl too, right? We want to make sure we're as relevant as possible. A lot of the syringe access programs are having a hard time of shifting really quickly with the smoking aspect because we've done injecting. And then I know maybe like, who was it like a month or two ago, like everybody was all upset that people were giving out safer smoking kits and it was like, you know we give out syringes, right? You know what I mean? Like, so like having those conversations and the kind of the racist dog whistle that came around that, we really want to engage with folks because we also do street outreach in high drug traffic areas and we want to be as relevant as possible to folks. If you don't inject, great, but if you smoke, Let's get you the tools you need so we're creating a relationship. So if you ever want to do something different, we're the first folks you come to. HRAC is in the blue, County of Denver is in the orange. For the first couple of years, we were a syringe access program. We were only a fixed site on the west side of town, meaning we couldn't do mobile street outreach with syringes. So now we can go anywhere in the city and county of Denver and engage with folks in those high drug traffic areas and encampments. 72% of our folks identify as male. 0.5% of our folks identify as trans. There's a lot of underground hormones and steroids going back and forth. You need a larger gauge syringe, like a 23 or a 21. That's really hard to come by. And an inch or an inch and a half to do that muscular. So we want to make sure that folks have what they need. 29% uh, of folks are housed, meaning their name is on the lease or mortgage. 29% unstable. 53% are homeless. That's primarily folks that stay on the streets. Um, I think it's a very tall ask to ask unhoused folks to be sober with all the crisis management that happens. Also, in most of the overnight men's shelters in town, there's no bathroom doors on the stalls in the bathroom. There's no bathroom doors on the stalls because they've had so many overdoses in there, but uh, that can also be a dignity issue for so many folks. 90% of folks have never been to syringe access program before. 73% heard about us from a friend. It's hard to walk into a party by yourself. Imagine walking into the exchange. A lot of people think we're the cops because why would we lure them in and be nice to them if we didn't want to get them, right? Or they think the cops sit out front and profile. In other states, they do that, which is like the worst street cred ever, right? Um, we have a good thing going that DPD won't do that. 33% of folks had no health insurance at time of intake. We do have 2% of our folks that are veterans. We are about, shit, 20, 21 years into the current war. We have had quite a few folks that started heroin in Afghanistan. 19% of folks are Hep C positive upon intake, 3% are HIV positive. For the folks that don't know their status, do you want to test today so we can do that on site? Um, a lot of that 3% that come to us are out of care because of that tumultuous relationship with people who use drugs and healthcare providers. So our number one thing is like, let's get you back into care. Let's yell at somebody. After reviewing all the research to date, the senior scientists at the Department of Health and Human Services and I have unanimously agreed that there is conclusive scientific evidence that syringe exchange programs as part of a comprehensive HIV prevention strategy are an effective public health intervention that reduces the transmission of HIV and does not occur as the use of illegal drugs. This is Dr. David Satter. Shout out what year you think he said that. This year, okay. 1984. 84, 93, 20. 96. 96. 98, welcome to 1998. And actually we've had syringe access programs in the United States since 1987. The first one was in Tacoma, Washington. The number of uh, Coloradans with hepatitis C continues to climb and I think I know why. So, all drugs need to be made as blood-like as possible to inject. So when folks don't have access to sterile water, it doesn't mean they don't inject. It means you use toilet tank water, river water, or saliva. If I'm hep C positive and I have my injecting water and I'm besties with Marty and Marty has heroin and it's like, where'd you get heroin, right? But he's in withdrawal and he has no water and I let him use my water, that's how he can get hepatitis C. Hepatitis C lives in injecting water for 62 days. So folks know not to share the syringes, but the cookers, the cottons, the tourniquets, the water, oftentimes that's where folks get hepatitis C. And if they don't get program supplies from us, they use the bottom of a pop can, right? An unpredictable water source, that sort of thing. How is there access to hepatitis C treatment? 
Uh, it's getting much better. You used to have to be abstinent for a long period of time to be able to do it. Now they've done a much better job, and it's not as terrible. The medication isn't as terrible as it used to be. Yeah. It's 12 weeks, a pill a week. Yeah, it's yeah. really so they, much so you probably better. Have, even if they do get it, you might still have a lot of issues with people being uh, compliant with the medication. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people want to get rid of it. They absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. They're very concerned about passing it on to somebody else. Yeah. You know, for our folks, too, is like we talk a lot about health education and stuff. And it's much easier for people to care about other people. So it's like, you know, if you and I were both hep C positive, we're like, let's share it. It's like, no, 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 we can, there's different genotypes that can attack the liver. Like they really thirst for that factual health information. So if there's a way to get rid of it, they're super pumped to do so. You, you, you provide that? No, no, we refer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's tough because they don't really want to go into a healthcare provider, much like PrEP, right? PrEP is to prevent HIV for folks. So if you're feeling terrible, you don't want to go into a healthcare provider because they're going to treat you like shit. So oftentimes it's very difficult to get them to start on that medication with Hep C or with PrEP because they're feeling fine and don't want to go in and be judged. Because a lot of times, I mean, classic example is um, sometimes people in recovery, oftentimes you'll see a full sleeve of tattoos. You'll see a full sleeve of tattoos because they're covering up the, the scar marks and things like that because they don't want people to judge them for the rest of their lives. So oftentimes there's a lot of that judgment that even comes with the scarring for the rest of people's lives. And so like there's so much of that stigma. I mean, you know, there's a deeply entrenched street rumor in Denver, you're gonna be warrant checked in the emergency departments. That's false, that's a HIPAA violation, but that doesn't speak to their relationship with cops, that speaks to their relationship with docs. We've also had it that a lot of folks who get abscesses, which is like bacteria or pus pockets, that's actually not in the blood and on the outside, which is much better, right? Have to be lanced. Oftentimes in the ED and urgent care, it's lanced without anesthesia because if it hurts enough, you'll stop doing drugs. Cute, 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 cute. All that happens is, is the next time it happens, they're lancing it in my bathroom, and if I don't allow that, it's happening underneath a bridge. So I do this presentation without margaritas, of course, um, to healthcare providers out there too to kind of bridge the access. If you believe it, I do this presentation also to cops too. They don't think I'm very funny, but whatever. <laughs> they get there, and they're dirty little secrets because they always tell me afterwards that they've been pricked, and I don't want them to get pricked for a variety of reasons. My folks know that if cops get pricked by their needle, they're gonna get the shit kicked out of them, right? We wanna make sure that cops don't get pricked and know about the law because also we believe that every single person that injects for the rest of their career, they're gonna have an issue with because they have that guttural feeling because they were so nervous about being pricked, right? So we wanna reduce them getting pricked and we wanna make sure that our folks can properly dispose and come across town and alert law enforcement. So this is the mag mag excuse me, magnification of a needle before use, after one use, and after six uses, it starts to curve and shred. When you don't have a syringe access program in your community, it doesn't mean that folks aren't injecting, it just means they're using that one on the right. Do you know what gauge that is? Sorry? Do you know what gauge that is? What gauge that is? No. Well, I mean, it could be, I mean, mostly people are using 28, 29s or 30s, half inch or 5 sixteenths. Yeah. yeah. But the curve thing, too, is really wild. It would happen higher the gauge, right? Excuse me? It would happen more higher the gauge. Well, this is the use. Yeah. So this is the, how many times you're using it. Yeah, so ideally, I mean, in the magical world, I want them to be one and done, but we don't have that kind of syringe access in the community, right? But what we do see on that one on the right, and oftentimes this is what happens a lot with like uh, people when people are incarcerated, is, is like matchbooks too. So they're really trying, or Wyoming. Wyoming will tell you they don't have people who inject drugs, bless their heart, but it's actually what they're using is the one on the right and matchbooks, but then it blows out your veins too. So you start here, we really don't want you here, we really don't want you here, right? When we do intramuscular, you have to have a larger gauge or a longer needle, and a lot of people, like a 5 16th or a half inch isn't gonna work, that's just skin popping, that's just getting under the skin, which makes it at higher risk for abscessing. You need like that inch to get into that muscle. Are you a pharmacist? No. Okay, I'm figuring you out, okay. Okay, so in all 35 states and 87 countries, syringe access programs look a little different. It's just a snapshot of us. We do, we have access to service providers on site, so Mental Health Center of Denver, substance use navigators, somebody that helps folks garner IDs, birth certificates, social security cards, transitional housing. We have an active people who inject drugs advisory committee where we talk about what's going on in the community, what's going on in the agency, and how we can push forward together. 
This is all where rules, regulations, policies, procedures, and all advocacy efforts come from. I hire active drug users. Um, I'd actually rather manage active drug users than folks that are on the methadone clinic. I do, obviously, I support treatment, but the methadone clinic first is like DMV customer service. Second of all, there's so much going on with like nurses and fuckery that they have to go to counseling and things like that. My folks who use drugs show up well and ready to go. We have access to mail and phone. We've passed seven pieces of statewide legislation in the last 12 years, made three Denver City policy changes. We believe the streets should influence the policies at the state capitol of Denver City Council, mobile street outreach and high drug traffic areas, health education classes, one's called HIV Hep C 101 to talk about the commonalities and differences. We talk about proper vein care. We have a wound care class. This came from the people who direct drugs advisory committee saying I need to know when I need to take care of it myself versus when I need to go to the emergency department. We only take 10 people per class because they're only two hours and we want to make sure there's not a lot of sidebar and stuff. For the first year and a half, 17 to 20 people were signing up per class. They were thirsting for that factual health information. We do referrals. We also re-register, well, we register uh, folks that are in-house. You don't need a home to vote. They can use our address. Folks that are formerly incarcerated and people who use drugs, we want to make sure that they're reflected um, in the ballot on the ballots and you know having their vote as their voice. They don't care too much about presidential elections, but they sure as shit care about ballot initiatives that affect their lives and the upcoming city council elections because we know you new mayor, new chief, new chief, new commanders, new everybody everywhere, right? So we want to make sure that folks' voices are heard. We do those tours and presentations, like I said, we lure them in. And then we do that on-demand HIV, Hep C, chlamydia, and gonorrhea testing. And I know what you're thinking. How is she as a neighbor? She's award-winning. Thank you for asking. <laughs> By the very nature of who we serve, I wouldn't even have the luxury of running a shit show, right? People are invested in the health and safety of the community in which we serve. Because we're that one safe space in the entire world, folks can talk realistically about their drug use. Four years ago, we won the award for creating a safe neighborhood from Chun. Capitol Hill United Neighborhood Association, the oldest and largest neighborhood association in town. So we put this puppy up in the window. It's one thing to win an award, you gotta tell people about that. <laughs> and then we also do litter cleanups. There's a lot of litter bugs in town. So every Wednesday, our participants do a participant-led cleanup, which has been really nice during the pandemic because it's outside, it's socially distanced, right? It's been a very lonely pandemic for a lot of folks. And so we're able to show people in the neighborhood, like, look at this great neighbor, litter bugs, am I right? Um, and that's been a nice opportunity that we do large cleanups too. The question of enabling, let's just talk about it. I got into harm reduction to enable people who use drugs to protect themselves and their communities from HIV, hepatitis C, and overdose, to feel like they have someone to talk to, someone who cares, someone who respects them in their humanity, to ask for help and to help others in turn, to find drug treatment and uh, health care, to reconnect with their families, to rebuild their lives, and to take personal responsibility for their health and their futures. If that makes me an enabler, I'm proud to claim that term. We went a long time not doing anything. We lost a lot of good people. You're goddamn right we're enabling people for healthier and safer than today. There's something positive that folks can do today. Okay, questions, in, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> questions, issues, concerns before we transition. Um, have you heard anything back about the Denver jails harm reduction kits that they're giving out to folks who are leaving jail? Have you gotten any feedback on that? Uh, I haven't, but I'm going in to present to the jail. Um, but I do know that they have done, they have put naloxone in their property for upon release for the last few years. Folks coming out of incarceration are 129 times more likely to overdose post-incarceration in those first two weeks than the general population. So I know they're doing those Narcan testing, and I think they're doing fentanyl testing strips as well. But I'm wiggling my way into the jail. That's how I do it. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm wiggling my way into the jail to kind of see what they're doing. Um, my folks haven't been talking about it right now, um, but we're pleased that they're trying to do that. I actually find that the criminal legal system is doing way more for folks um, than the healthcare provider system, oh. which is weird. Don't quote me, but it's like, fuck it, we're on live stream. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I'm intrigued by what you said when you, you know people come in and you offer them tests for HIV, for hepatitis C, uh, and, you know, you're able to refer them if they want a referral, you know, even for, like, they have an injury on their shoulder that needs to get you know, taken care of. Um, but I'm assuming most of these, 
people don't have health insurance, so you refer them somewhere. So what happens then if they say, yeah, I want to get this treatment? Well, most of them have Medicaid. So I do have somebody on site okay. that signs folks up for Medicaid. We want to reduce the harms associated with you accessing quality health care. And sometimes people are much nicer to you if you have Medicaid. And so if you qualify for that, they can sign up on site and get their card sent to us. Okay. Here's what's actually happening, too, is um, a, a lot of wounds come in. We're having that conversation. I don't do well with wounds. Nobody cares. They show me their wound. I'm like, ugh. Um, have I seen 12 seasons of Grey's Anatomy? Absolutely. But if I don't help kind of bandage it up, then nobody will. So there's a lot of kind of those conversations too. And it has gotten to the point sometimes where I'm like, you're about to lose an arm. You have to get in the vehicle. We are going to the emergency department. But that warrant checking thing is so hardcore. And with the kind of the, the nurses and healthcare providers um, in general, there is so much stigma that happens in there that really causes people to leave against medical advice. So they're, they're more worried about that issue than like how am I going to pay for this? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The warrant yeah. checking yeah. river. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah they're very Makes nervous sense. about that. Now, a lot of times they will go to the emergency department and oftentimes they're popped upstairs to be hospitalized because they should have been there weeks ago, right? Oftentimes they're not kept out of withdrawal. Now, I'm not asking any healthcare provider, anybody high, but they certainly need to be kept out of withdrawal or one of two things is gonna happen. First, they're gonna call their friend and have their friend bring them in heroin or fentanyl so they can be kept well to prioritize their other health needs. Or they leave AMA against medical advice and now you're branded a problem patient for the rest of your life. We also get it too, it's so wild, that a lot of times people will leave AMA because the healthcare system won't let people go outside for a cigarette. I mean, come the fuck on. Yeah. So they won't let people go outside for a cigarette, so people get to a place where they're just like, kind of get a case of the fuck it, and then they leave, and you're like, it was all just about a cigarette? Like, we could have done better on that. So I have heard of physicians like getting in trouble for taking people across the street and like, bumming them a cigarette or making sure they have a cigarette from like nurses going to staffing being like, well, they shouldn't have done that. And physicians are like, it kept them from leaving, right? We want to prioritize their other health needs. Yeah. Okay. Other questions before we transition? What was the main factor that drew you to this week? Yeah, so about 14 years ago, I was in AmeriCorps Vista at an aid service organization in Central Coast, California. Um, and so it just blew my mind, like syringe access just makes so much sense, right? At the same time, my husband and I were unhoused for about seven months, um, so I'd never felt so unsafe, right? You have to get your needs met all over town. You never get to sleep fully through the night uh, because you're like, oh, is that someone sketchy or is that the cops? And you're like, well, would I rather someone sketchy or the cops? So it just kind of like awoke this activist voice. So 12, 13 years ago, 13 years ago today, um, I became the executive director and they didn't have a syringe access program and I was like, that's weird. We gotta do this. So that's when we were able to pass that, you know, first legislation. It was very it was very difficult to work with people who inject drugs without the ability to illegally exchange syringes. That just didn't make any sense to me. And then once we got that going, then we got then they were like, Great, we got syringes, now we need naloxone. And I was like, Cool, 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 let's do that. And they're like, Great, we need to be able to call 911 in the event of an overdose and not get in trouble. It's like cool, 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 cool. So the le the Colorado State Legislature used to be really harm reduction friendly. I don't know, they're out of their goddamn minds this year. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but they, they really want to do the right thing and they want to make sure that folks have access. And in the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in, People need to make sure they have naloxone and syringes and be able to call 911 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chanel? Have you thought about possibly, and I don't even know, I think it comes down to funding, but I think maybe a mobile harm reduction um, clinic could be cool, especially one that um, can improve 100% confidentiality, all those kinds of things. I'm sure it comes down to where are the nurses, you know, who can manage these. Um, I guess the actual mobile clinics, like that. Yeah, so Denver, so there is, we do mobile street outreach, but then there are, a, Denver does a pretty good job. They do have Wellness Winnie, which is a dumb name, and it's an even dumber name. Wellness what? Wellness Winnie. Winnie? Winnie, yeah. Winnie. There's quite the focus group about that, right. clearly. Uh, but Stout Street Clinic has a really good, you know, Stout Street Clinic is right over here. They do an excellent job working with folks that are unhoused and people who use drugs, and they have a homeless outreach uh, program van 
uh, that goes around to different shelters and provide excellent care too. So um, it's in the shop again. I mean, it's always in the shop. Uh, but we're hoping to get it back up so that we can be accessing our place too. Because I'd much rather have, I'd like to have wound care on site. Um, it's been a liability issue, quite frankly, on our end and on their end. Um, but it's like, I mean, without telling this live stream, like now it's me wrapping stuff, you know? So yeah. it's like the, the liability is there, you know? Like we can reduce that for sure. Yeah. Earlier you were talking about people intentionally consuming fentanyl. Oh yeah. And I was curious, uh, it, it sounded like the, the blues, which I assume are like the M30s. Uh -huh. Okay. So when people that are intentionally using fentanyl are mostly smoking those. Like Correct. The, gotcha. Yes. Okay. I appreciate that. And I also forgot to talk about the third tier. The third tier are folks taking the M30s or the blues, thinking they're an oxy or Xanax, but they have, are an unpredictable drug supply of fentanyl because legislators have legislated us out of a safe supply of opioids, right? You can't go after Purdue and then be mad that people are still using drugs and still using pills and going to the street and now they're getting the same unpredictable drug supply as the rest of us. So that kind of, that's the iron law of prohibition. You go after this and this comes up here, yeah. So our folks, you know, and that's, that was a lot of stuff with the um, the legislation this year too, and some of the rhetoric of like, no one would seek fentanyl. It's like, people absolutely seek fentanyl because you don't get access to heroin anymore because heroin's almost gone. Now, what's coming from the East Coast, you know, so they've had fentanyl since 2014. Now it's xylazine. Xylazine is a veterinary tranquilizer. That's not gonna, Narcan's not gonna work on that, right? We're also seeing, you know, all sorts of other stuff coming out that's synthetically made because it's much easier to make things in a lab. Another question. <clears throat> um, so you mentioned xylazine. Um, I'm curious about, there's a handful of like highly potent benzodiazepines mm -hmm. that have shown up on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear your feelings about, obviously I don't know what makes a highly potent additive become highly prevalent, mm -hmm. right? Like go from an occasional cut to like a fentanyl situation. Yeah. But are you worried about that at all? Like Absolutely. On your, yep, yeah. they're calling it benzo dope. Yep. Benzo so it's, yeah. But they're putting benzos in fentanyl as a cheaper cut. Yeah. But the problem is with benzos is that Narcan doesn't right. work for benzos either. Yeah. And drugs are synergistic, meaning it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals four. So any mixing puts you at higher risk of overdosing. So yes, that's folks going around that fentanyl is about to be done because the iron law of prohibition means more law enforcement this way. Again, we had a $3.2 billion DEA budget last year and 9,000 employees. They can't get the cartel. So like, this is happening. So this is a public health emergency that demands a public health approach, not doubling down on the worst ideas of the drug war, which is criminalization and incarceration. Are, are we gonna talk more about uh, what our other options are as far as oh yes okay. yes this is just this is the this is like the um the free game we'll get there yes okay all right people are transitioning i told you we're transitioning okay is this hard to read yes but i just want to show that we are in the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in and most of the time you see a graph it's from 1999 but we've been losing a lot of people for a really long time this starts in the 1980s in 2020, we lost 93,331 folks in the United States to a drug overdose death. Of that 93,000, we lost 1,400 in the state of Colorado. Of that 1,400, we lost 370 in the city and county of Denver. New numbers have come out for 2021. We lost 107,000 folks in the United States to a drug overdose death, 1,800 in the state of Colorado, and 454 in the city and county of Denver. We're not even plateauing in this overdose crisis. There was a was there a reduction during COVID? No, an increase. No, no an increase. Yeah. What was the little hump? In the that was like 2017, 2018. People yeah. were like, what happened there? And we're like, mm. yeah. sometimes states don't uh, also tell their data too, so that could be part of the problem. It's yeah. like Arkansas. What are you doing? You know, yeah. like I don't want to like be like, what's up with Arkansas? But yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we knew, okay, so COVID is not the reason we're in an overdose crisis, but it didn't help uh, at all. So in the uh, middle of 2020, we were top four for most drug-related deaths in the United States. That's not where we want to be. It was kind of the perfect trifecta, right? Fentanyl has been here since 2018, but it was certainly here with the vengeance in 2020. Using alone puts you at higher risk of overdosing because there's no one there to witness, recognize, or respond. And we know that relapse can be a part of recovery for so many folks. 
Any period of abstinence puts folks at higher risk of overdosing. So it really was that kind of perfect trifecta. These are 19 of my participants that died of very public overdose deaths. Out, yes. When you say abstinence puts them at a higher risk of overdose, is that because they're tolerant? They, they think they they think they still got it, but they don't. They don't. Yeah, and with this unpredictable drug supply now too, if you've been, uh, you know, living a life recovery for any period of time, your body is like does not know anything about fentanyl. Yeah, yeah so it's got that tolerance issue. Uh, so these are 19 of my participants that died of very public overdose deaths in the last few years, outside in alleys, in parks, and in business bathrooms. When folks are unhoused, they use outside in alleys, in parks, and in business bathrooms. They prioritize injecting in business bathrooms first for three reasons. One is you can close the door, the cops don't come up on you like they can in an alley. Two is so the larger community and kids don't see them. Three is so they have access to that sterile water we talked about earlier. It used to be cops coming up on people overdosing and everybody was okay with that. Now it's 17 year old baristas who are being re-triggered every day because they don't want to clean the bathroom before they go home because they've come up on somebody overdosing. So we have, you know, grocery stores. Have you ever been to the uh, King Supers at 13th and Spear? They have blue lights in their bathroom. They have blue lights in their bathroom so you can't find your veins in there because they have so many overdoses happening in there. That's not to say you don't have a cell phone light now, right? You can do that or here. But for from 2000, shit, from 2013 to 2016, 14th and Spear was the largest drug dealing trafficking corner of the city. So what the people were trying to do is not, they were buying and selling there, but they were trying not to use there because that kind of blows it up. So the only unlocked bathroom was that King Super's bathroom, and they had so many overdoses in there, they put the blue lights in there. They also have, it's locked, the door is locked currently. So if you ask staff for the key, they won't give you the code. They'll walk you to it, unlock it, stand outside, and then walk back. That's a staff capacity issue because they had so many overdoses happen in there. The Ninth and Corona King Supers has had deaths in there, RTD transit stations, Starbucks. I mean, you know, unions running an injection site is just not supervised, much like Civic Center was running an injection site that wasn't supervised, much like the library was running an injection site that wasn't supervised. Um, so we'll see where they kind of shift people next. Okay, there's four main reasons why people overdose. The first is the quality of the drug, the supply is unpredictable. Second main reason is any period of abstinence, coming out of jail, prison, treatment, living a life for recovery. Folks coming out of incarceration are 129 times more likely to overdose post-incarceration in those first two weeks than the general population. The third main reason is mixing, so benzos and fentanyl, alcohol and fentanyl. And then the fourth main reason is simply using alone by the very fact that no one's there to witness, recognize, or respond. So there's signs and symptoms. There's a difference between being really high, muscles become relaxed, speech is slow and slurred, sleepy looking and nodding, but will respond to a sternal rub. Versus overdose is a deep snoring or gurgling. It's called the death rattle. They say if you've ever heard it, you'll never forget it. Very frequent or no breathing, the pale or clammy skin, the heavy nod not responsive to that stimulation, the blue or gray skin tinge of the lips or fingertips depending on skin color because an opioid overdose is lack of oxygen and slow heartbeat. We have the antidote, it's called naloxone or Narcan, it's safe and highly effective. We talked about paramedics and emergency departments have been using it for over 40 years, which is really great if overdoses happen around paramedics or emergency departments. So it needs to be in the hands of people who use drugs first and foremost, and then anybody walking on earth. It's an opioid antagonist, you can't get high from it. The only thing it can do is knock the opioid off the receptor and hold for 30 to 90 minutes while you rescue breathe for someone to call 911. That's it, it's simply a time buyer. What's nice is, is if you don't have opioids in your system, it won't do anything to you. You can't fuck it up, that's what's so nice. <laughs> okay, so who's seen Pulp Fiction? Excellent, thank you so much. I do this at colleges and they're like, I've never heard of that movie. You know, like, okay, you know, remember, she thought she was snorting cocaine out of his pocket, but that was actually China White heroin, right? But remember, he got her in the car and took her across town back to the drug seller's house. Now, they said it was adrenaline in the heart. What Quentin should have done, he never calls. What Quentin should have done is had naloxone in the arm. The way that she wakes up, that big like, <gasps> that's how people wake up. So he could have trained an entire generation. Um, he just simply didn't. But I try to do this, like I said, in college classes. They're like, I've never heard of that. That sounds like a cult classic. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> so there's four main Narcans. This one goes up on nostril and sprays. The middle one is kind of intranasal. Uh, the bottom one's injectable. It goes through the arm here or here. The one on the left is the Evzio Auto Injector. It used to be $200, now it's $2,000. Don't worry about it. Um, but it's the way for the future because it talks to you. Because if you've ever recognized and responded to an overdose, it's really scary. For our visual learners, opioids fit exactly on the receptor, lock and key. 
And then naloxone is simply that bully. It bullies it off for 30 to 90 minutes. Where does it go? Well, yes, it's, we're, we're hoping it's metabolizing, right? Um, if it's a methadone overdose, we know that that's going to come back because that's so much longer acting. It's a longer acting opioid. But most of the time that it kind of comes back and people are in withdrawal, like it's physically painful, but if they let it wear off, if they let the naloxone wear off, the overdose doesn't usually come back. Yeah, but they love those receptors. Much like sugar. Sugar loves those same receptors. Good question. Yes. Someone is currently also has other substances in their bloodstream. Okay. Will that interfere with this chemical interaction? No, nope. it'll actually give somebody a chance because it doesn't work on alcohol or benzos. But if they have opioids, at least you can try and it's getting it off that receptor and holding while you rescue breathe and people still get a chance. So even if you have naloxone and you suspect it's an opioid overdose but they smell like alcohol, you would still want to do it. For example, we've recognized and responded to about 25 overdoses in and around my agency in the last 12 years. And sometimes I'm the rescue breather, come to find out I'm a terrible rescue breather. Um, but I had one that was like, we ran across the street and I was rescue breathing for the guy and um, he definitely had been drinking alcohol. I was very intimate. And uh, when he woke up, we were found out that he had taken a, a pill, like an oxy or whatever, and drinking, he was older. And then he kept telling everybody he hadn't been drinking and I had to be the jerk that was like, sir, I was very intimate with you. I know that you were drinking. Like it's just, it's in, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, don't let, you know, don't let him fool you. But because you don't know, because those drugs are synergistic. So, you know, Part of the problem is, is when you're drinking that everything sounds like a good idea, you lose track of time, so sometimes that's like a lot of times where people will do a shot of heroin or take a pill. Um, when we talk to folks who drink and use opioids, we tell them use your opioids first. If you still need to drink, then drink after that. You know, We want to make sure, because that's your unpredictable supply, and alcohol is actually a safe supply, so at least you kind of know what you're getting with that. Best friend? So the naloxone does not activate the receptor, it just blocks the receptor. Correct. And then if they are taking one of those synergistic drugs as well, the synergistic effect goes away, and now it's not one plus one equals four, it's just the one. Yeah. 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 And it gives people, it's all about the breathing. It's all about that lack of oxygen. Because that's why a lot of times you hear, like, somebody will die of an overdose right away, needle in the arm, or over hours, right? And that's very classic that, you know, like somebody goes to bed and then they've had like a very muffled uh, or um, snoring kind of situation. And everybody talks about that in hindsight, um, but that's like, was them kind of gasping for air. Um, but nobody really talks about that. Lisa, <clears throat> the increase of fentanyl, or is that requiring more doses to reverse an overdose? Not necessarily. So fentanyl is an opioid. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, oftentimes you might hear people say, oh, it took five doses of Narcan for somebody to come out. And it was like, well, did you do one do dose, rescue breathe once every seven seconds for three minutes, do another dose, rescue breathe once every seven seconds? Or are you freaking the fuck out because it's super scary and you're doing back to back to back to back, which violently knocks the opioid off the receptor? Oh, I got wild. Did you see me? <laughs> I just had to wake up the computer. Okay, I did. I kind of that's it. Okay. Whew. IT was like, oh, oh. <laughs> woo! Uh, yeah. So, and there's a lot of like misinformation out there too. You know, right now they're trying to push out an eight milligram Narcan called Cloxado. Hate it. Nobody asked for it, right? Four milligrams definitely works. Eight milligrams is violently knocking it off there. So people who use drugs and people who love people who use drugs never ask for that at all. But the manufacturers are trying to push that out saying, only it'll only work on fentanyl. Because going again, that communications director for the war on drugs is doing a really great job getting misinformation out there. She's terrible, I hate her. Yes. Um, what <laughs> Dosage and rescue breathing in addition Oh, we're going to get there in just a second. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm going to teach you. Thank you. Okay, good transition, Dr. Chanel. Okay, <laughs> so we're responding to an overdose. Are you all right? Are you okay? Um, you know when people are like laying out really weird and you're like, somebody should do something? It's you, babe. So oftentimes, like, I'll, t I'll tap the leg, right? Or, you know, um, kind of do the sternum rub, <laughs> that sort of thing. And uh, I always do this like, oh my God, are you okay, sir? Are, and you know something's wrong. They're not responding to you. If somebody's like, oh yeah, no, I'm cool, th then they're cool, right? If they're not responding, you're like, oh shit, it's happening. And so you wanna lay somebody out on their back. Now you need, don't need to do CPR, the heart is fine. It's lack of oxygen. So you'd go under their neck, close their nose, two big breaths right off the top, like I said, it's very intimate. Then let's say you have Narcan, you're gonna put it up the nostril, 
Now you're gonna rescue breathe once every seven seconds for three minutes, which are the longest three minutes of your life, I can assure you. And what you wanna do is time me, right? Say time me, and people do it on the, on the, I was gonna say the calculator, but I think it's a cell phone. Continue rescue breathing. If they're not awake after three minutes, you gotta give it time to work. Then we use the other dose. So each kit comes with two doses. If you call 911, you do not have to say someone's overdosing. You can say my friend is not breathing. Nine times out of 10, you won't get the cuffs. Because over dispatch, someone not breathing, sounds like a medical emergency. Overdose? Well, I'm bored. Let's just bebop over there. We don't need the cops. We're looking for medical. Get out of there. Yes, my friend is not breathing. Are you all, or are, are you all right? Are you OK? Pain stimulus? Also, if you're with a couple people, you want to say, you call 911. That way we know you're calling, you know you're calling. Two big breaths right off the top. Narcan, once every seven seconds for three minutes. If they're not awake, use the other one. If, if they're not a friend and they're a stranger, I mean, are you worried about HPV or other things that could be, you know, if you're doing lip to lip? No. Okay. Nope. Nope, you can't get hepatitis that way. You can't get HIV that way. You HPV, can't get, yeah. yeah, well, but get in there, bud. Okay, are you a doctor? If you're not a pharmacist, are you a doctor? Oh, you're like an onion, sir. My goodness, HPV. Okay, I'm at I'm Columbo. Okay, I'm, I'm adding into it. Okay. All right. Uh, Katie, get him for the next presentation about HPV. Okay. So training can be done by staff or pharmacists with standing orders. Must include risk factors, recognition, calling 911, rescue breathing, and administration of naloxone. So I just trained you. That's a free gift with purchase. This is our overdose memorial wall. This is our Y. And actually that right side of the wall, you can see you can, a little bit, you can see that fire hydrant. We've actually have to add probably about 25 to 30 photos just this year of folks that we've lost. It doesn't have to be like this. People don't have to die of a preventable overdose. Um, there is a lot of misinformation on the street. I mean, how many times in a movie have you seen them throw somebody in the shower, right? There's a lot of street myths where he's sticking ice up their ass or things like that, you know, because like, People don't know. If you don't know, you don't know. Naloxone works. We have access to fentanyl testing strips where folks can test their drugs to see if fentanyl or fentanyl analogs are present before they use so they know. We've trained over 2,000 folks in the last four years. We've had 6,866 responses. So if they, if they use it, we want to talk about it and figure it out. Here's the thing. In the next six months to a year, I probably won't give out the strips anymore because everything's going to have fentanyl in it. That's why I'm here, babe. Everything. Everything. It's over. Or it's happening. I don't know. Okay. So, uh, healthcare providers. Uh, we did a study with healthcare providers in the emergency department and inpatient because we know our folks are having problems. It's like, well, let's talk to healthcare providers about it. Um, clinicians identified several barriers. 136 of them didn't know where to send patients to access harm reduction services. We are three blocks from Denver Health. We are figuring that out. 97 clinicians felt they needed to prioritize connecting patients to treatment over harm reduction. That must be really frustrating because the only thing that they can do is Suboxone. Um, if, you, if people use stimulants and want to get into treatment, it's very difficult. Um, basically, housing is substance use treatment for stimulant users. Um, we do have medication assisted treatment, so methadone and Suboxone for folks, but healthcare providers can't really push forward with methadone unless they're at a clinic. 154 clinicians deferred harm reduction conversations to social workers or similar staff. I never get access to social workers, so I tell healthcare providers they have to talk about it. As you can imagine, some people think I'm an advocate, others think I'm a nag. Uh, 72 clinicians felt they didn't have enough time to discuss harm reduction with patients. So I really want to give people what they need because I need them to have better relationships in the community. That's why we take that technical assistance with bureaucratic institutions. So like importantly, like I want law enforcement and my folks to have a better relationship with the community. I want healthcare providers to have a better relationship with our folks in the community. Here's what pissed me off. 34 clinicians said that people who, uh, that people should be put in jail or prison if they are caught with illicit drugs. And an additional 33 clinicians were unsure whether people should be put in jail or prison if they are caught with illicit drugs. These are medical providers. <laughs> okay, anybody in the state of Colorado can carry naloxone and has been able to since 2013. We've limited civil and criminal liability. Nobody's ever been sued for trying to do the right thing. There's 470 pharmacies today in the state of Colorado. Folks can get access to naloxone virtually over the counter. It's a prescription drug, but you don't need to go to a physician. You can go into that pharmacy and they're working under a standing order. Most major insurances cover it. You just have to pay your copay. 
204 law enforcement departments in the state carry Narcan. DPD was first. Colorado Springs PD was second. And there's six county jails that train heroin users in jail how to recognize and respond to an overdose and put that naloxone in their property for upon release. That's Arapahoe, Boulder, Denver, Douglas, Larimer, and Jefferson County jails. Yes. If you don't have insurance, how much would it cost you to walk into a pharmacy? Oh, it's very expensive. Yeah. 184. $184. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I get nervous. Honestly, I get nervous about, you know, we're supposed to be really supportive of it being over the counter. I get a little nervous because sometimes with over the counter, insurance won't pay, which means that folks won't be able to access it. One of the reasons we passed this legislation that folks could access in the pharmacy was essentially to hug and release the moms because they were coming to us and I only have enough to give my folks and so it's very difficult to give it to the larger community because they just don't have that sort of access. So I needed to hug and release it to the pharmacy. So when the pharmacies make it really weird, which I can assure you they make it really weird, I think this onion's a pharmacist, my Colombo spidey sense is feeling it, um, <laughs> that uh, it's weird for everybody. And so like I, pharmacists are tough. Like When I present to pharmacists, they definitely don't think I'm funny. But also, I have to use the same language with pharmacists that I use with cops. They're very conservative. Pharmacists can sell syringes right now. They just often don't. And oftentimes when I'm like, hey, you can sell syringes, they're like, oh no, if I don't sell syringes, people won't use drugs. Oh, it's the cutest thing. It's like, sir, they're actually gonna go out to the parking lot and share and reuse. That's what's happening. Have you done any research on um, if European pharmacies that ship their pharmacies They do have a very robust, I appreciate you bringing that up because you're a MRA, you know what I mean? Smitten kitten. Uh, your skirt would look really cute in here. Um, they, uh, we do, there is Next Distro that does ship syringes and naloxone to rural areas a lot of times for those folks that like would lose their entire anonymity in life for going into the pharmacy and they do a really good job of that too and so that's been really, that's it's mail based. That's newer, um, but that's been really helpful for that stigma. Stigma is real, and stigma kills people, right? And so a lot, like, for example, my place, if you're walking in and out of my place and people are driving by and know what my place is, like, whether or not you're somebody that uses, you could potentially be branded, and sometimes people could lose their entire lives that way. Yeah. Okay, so we passed syringe exchange legislation in 2010. We have two 911 Good Samaritan laws. Marty and I are hanging out doing drugs. He overdoses, in good faith, I call 911 and stay with him. We don't get new drug charges. He goes to the hospital. I go on my merry way incentivized. Participant exemption. The standing orders passed in 2015. All 100 state legislators voted in support of it. And they were like, if you want Narcan today, you should have Narcan today. And we're like, yes. OK, wait. Questions, issues, concerns before I talk about the legislation and other things? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so with the Narcan specifically, there's been a shortage recently. and so. I know quite a few harm reduction organizations that are getting Narcan that is expired, yep. like it's listed expired, yep. um, and they're claiming that it would still be good as long as it's kept at a stable temperature. Yep. And that, is that the case? Oh, absolutely. And yep. for how long would that be the case? 30 years. 30 years. That's yes, so Narcan's good for 30 years, but the company wants you to buy it every 18 months to two years. It's like, we see you. We actually passed legislation a couple years ago that you can use expired Narcan in the state of Colorado because you're trying to do the right thing, which is really awesome. So a lot of times, like for example, those 204 law enforcement departments, they can't really use expired, which is fine. So they'll donate it to us when they purchase their new stuff. Um, so that's really helpful because I can really push that out to folks. Uh, but yeah, they've done a couple of studies and found that even if it's outside of the 59 to 77 degrees, it degrades maybe 10%, so it's still be able to use. My folks are primarily unhoused, meaning their naloxone and Narcan is outside all the time, winter and summer, and we have never had any problems. So it's really nice to be able to have that. Yes. Gotcha. So would that also suggest, I've also seen a lot that if you're keeping the Narcan in your car, yeah. you should replace it every three to four months because of the high changes in temperature? I would say every couple of years, but we don't okay. really encourage it to be in the car. Right. Um, but, you know, at this point, it's like I need people carrying it. Yes, and it's really hard to get. Totally. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Doctor? If you want to save money on it and you don't have really good insurance, good RX, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's like a way to get you on drugs. You don't have, to have health insurance. Okay, um, so you are a pharmacist. No. Okay, all right, all right. You can get it for 47 bucks. Yes, $47. 
from the guy that's not a pharmacist. <laughs> is that what you would recommend, like just for someone that's not a patient at your clinic, but not the mom that you know can go? Oh yeah, if you walk on Earth, if you're around here, I need you carrying it. But Absolutely. Is that the best way? Is that what you would recommend for just someone in the middle to have it? Yeah, I mean, forty-seven dollars is a little bit. I totally get that. So the uh, the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment, you can sign up on their online. You gotta give them all your info. Though. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, they don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? Like, they got their own problems. Like, I run an exchange and I'm not worried about the cops. You know what I mean? Um, but that dreamboat Kyle Clark from Channel 9, he's now carrying it. Dreamy. Okay, Kyle. And do you work for Kyle Clark? No. No, okay. And uh, I'm going to figure this out. And you follow him, but no. Oh, yeah, I know. We're best friends. Uh, but uh, so 5,000 people signed up for it in Denver because you can get that free stuff. So they're a little behind. I totally get that. Um, but I can... I can be supportive, find me afterwards. But don't tell everybody. Dr. C. <laughs> Spelling on Narcan? N-A-R-C-A-N. Okay, just like it sounds. Yeah, yeah. Great. And then the lock zone is a little trickier. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right, people. Let's talk about this goddamn bill. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, so we're in, so we're in an election year. We're in the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in. We've been shouting from the rooftops. We need overdose prevention sites. We need safe supply. And legislators came back in a dem supermajority and said, how about criminalization of people who use drugs? And we said, no, we hate it. And then they passed it and Polis is definitely gonna sign it. So there's some money in it too because they tried to kind of uh, be like, oh, well, there's some harm reduction money in there. And are you part of the legislature? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> figure that out, I will figure that out. Um, and uh, so there's money in there for naloxone, money in there for fentanyl testing strips, money in there for harm reduction. This came because of the Behavioral Health Task Force that let, met last fall, because this is one-time flash funding from the ARPA funding. So this isn't legislators this year being like, oh, let's just, let's do it. It's a, this is funding that had to go into a bill. I thought it'd be its own bill, bless my little heart about that. No, they're like, you know what? Let's put it in that fentanyl criminalization bill and we'll all feel good about passing it. And I was like, no, I hate it. So we opposed it right off the top and people were like, how could you oppose it? It had money in there. And I was like, I oppose it for a few reasons. One is they have drug-induced homicides in there. Once this passes, well, it passed. Once it's signed and it starts July 1st, every overdose death is going to be a murder investigation, which means no one's going to call 911 anymore. They act like they're getting mid-level sellers. You don't get mid-level sellers with this. You get low-level sellers who are also users. And what we found in Pennsylvania and Ohio, some of the largest drug overdose death rates in the United States, they have drug-induced homicides. It's friends and family members that are spending time incarcerated. This is a mandatory minimum of eight years. Eight to 32 years, and they passed it. And hardly anybody talked about it. So when we were talking to my folks about it, they were very upset, as you can imagine, so they signed do not prosecute orders. This came from the American Alliance of Drug User Union saying, in the case of my overdose death, I do not want my seller prosecuted. Is it legal? Probably not. But it was to show that people do not want this. People who use drugs absolutely positively do not want this because also drugs sell themselves and by the time it gets to the streets, the supply is unpredictable. And it's not just an unpredictable drug supply. What if you've had a period of abstinence, right? What if you've been drinking? You know, and most of the time what we are finding is um, it is friends and loved ones. Broken No More is the largest harm reduction advocacy group of families who have lost someone to overdose in the United States. They recently came out with an anti-drug-induced homicide statement, which is amazing, right? They're saying, no, we don't want this done in our loved one's name because there's a lot of, uh, you know, they brought out a lot of moms on this one saying that they want this, this kind of justice and vengeance. Um, it does nothing to decrease overdose deaths. Putting somebody a seller away means another seller comes in its place. Okay, then they, then, then these more added in felonization of fentanyl in one gram, which is 10 pills, right? We talked about that our folks are smoking five to 20 per day. They cannot currently tell you how much fentanyl is in a pill. They can only tell you if fentanyl is in a pill. So they are treating every pill as though it was 100% fentanyl. So add a gram. 
Then we have mandatory treatment, which is a little wild, only in that we don't really have a lot of treatment now for folks that are using, uh, that want it voluntarily. So I'm not sure what the plan is because they also didn't put any funding in for treatment. And then they have OD mapping. We're very concerned about OD mapping. Marty and I are hanging out doing drugs at my house. He overdoses and goes to the hospital. He lives. Two days later, the cops come to my house to offer services. What kind of services are the cops offering at my house a couple days later, except uh, criminalizing and uh, surveillance in the neighborhood um, and potential warrant checking? So no, I don't like this bill. Thank you for asking. Uh, this is uh, the drug-induced homicide charges by state, 1974 to 2018. The first one's Pennsylvania, the second one's Ohio. So it has done nothing to decrease drug overdose death rates in the United States. It will just solidify the fact that no one will ever call 911 again because why would you? IT guy in the back, yes. How does this conflict with I Thank you for asking. They, uh, oh, sorry, can you repeat the question? How, how is it going to conflict with the Good Samaritan laws? I'm concerned about that. They've gaslit me the entire session about that. They're like, oh no, we'll carve it out. And I was like, no. Um, my concern is, is that if Marty and I are hanging out doing drugs, well, that's my concern all the time. Marty, chill. Jesus Christ, Marty. He overdoses and he goes in, cops come. It doesn't mean they're going to wait to see if he died or not. They're going to start investigating right fucking now. Right now. They're going to start warrant checking everybody. Um, they're going to start, you know, they're not going to let everybody go. They're going to start right then. So then that just solidifies the fact that, you know, so it's going to undermine the Good Samaritan Law. Um, it, was it the best Good Samaritan Law we've ever had? Absolutely not, right? But most of them aren't that great in the United States. Um, but that's going to be a problem. So for people on the ground, they're trying to like give advice, right? Generally, the advice is like call 911 and then pursue naloxone and rescue breathing, right? Is that still the advice? We say breathe Narcan 911, but okay. nobody's mandated to call 911. Again, we don't call 911, so right. we understand that that's a barrier for folks. Okay. There's no incentive. I mean, at this point, there would be no incentive to call 911. Yeah, well, so that the <laughs> reason that I've been told is that you'll run into the, the naloxone running out before the person is done, the opioids have run out of their system. Sometimes, right. like the overdose could come back after the 30 to 90 minutes, that's very rare. Again, if it's methadone, you do have to get them to a medical provider, absolutely. Um, but you could also have, if you had a couple of doses, you could keep you know, keep somebody going for quite a while. Yeah. Now, you know, our biggest thing is if you're using the doses, you've used both of them, you've been rescue breathing and they're still not awake, then it's something else and you have to call 911, and you'll have to. But this has really undermined the, the entire, you know, it's very difficult when you're trying to call a number for medical and you could potentially get law enforcement. And law enforcement is really chomping at the bit. They, Phil Weiser, the Attorney General, truly believes he could cut off the supply of fentanyl in Colorado. It's wild. He thinks the sellers are coming around the corner to murder you. Like, this is definitely his narrative out there. And I was like, talk about somebody who's never bought or sold drugs. You know what I mean? Okay, we have the Safer Syringe Disposal Initiative. These are about four feet high syringe disposal kiosks. They're 24 seven. If you've ever been in New York City, you've bumped into them all over the place. We have about six of these in Denver because there are barriers to proper disposal. Pharmacies can sell syringes but don't allow for it. Hours of operation for syringe access programs can be limited. There's a fear of ticketing or additionally days incarcerated. Difficult, excuse me, difficulty disposing or public disposal access is rare. And it is an issue for unhoused diabetics. A lot of folks who are unhoused um, don't want to go be at the shelter and be like, here are my syringes, I am an unhoused diabetic. And what do people say? Sure you are, right? And a lot of times you can get kicked out of the shelters if they know that they use. People living in chaotic drug use tend to be more successful at making positive changes in their lives if they first have their most basic needs met, like food and shelter, access to healthcare, meaningful connection to being treated with dignity, regardless of whether or not they continue to use drugs and not contingent on the difficult circumstances in their lives have changed. Okay, so that's everything we can currently do to prevent and eliminate the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. Resources, referrals, naloxone, fentanyl testing strips. It's not legal for them to use on my property. Use and possession on the property can get the property seized. So they go a few blocks away to an alley or business bathroom and they use their often alone. Not only they're using there, they're overdosing there. Not only they're overdosing there, they're dying of overdose, uh, overdoses in public places. 
we are the folks pushing forward with overdose prevention sites. It would simply be a program arm of an already flourishing syringe access program, maybe on the southeast corner of 8th and Lincoln. The drugs are pre-obtained, meaning they're not bought or sold on site, and people would inject or use themselves. It reduces the acquisition of HIV and hepatitis C. It reduces those skin tissue infections. If I'm about to inject in an alley behind a dumpster, I may not take that time to use that alcohol pad. It promotes proper disposal. It's currently happening in 12 countries and 150 sites in the last 20 to 30 years. No one's ever died of an overdose at one of these places because it's a trained professional there to recognize and respond. And the same cannot be said for Starbucks, RTD Transit Station, King Supers, right? We've got the major players at the top. The number one substance use treatment admission requirement is you have to be alive. At the bottom, it does not increase community drug use. It does not increase initiation into injection drug use. It does not increase drug-related crime. People are invested in the health and safety of the community in which you serve because you're that one safe space. And however you feel about it, we'll always have use sites in town. I want mine supervised and sterile. We talked about public restrooms being ground zero, baristas being on the front lines. Um, in 2018, so three years ago, uh, Denver City Council passed the nuisance exemption ordinance in Denver, 12 to one, to give that nod to statewide legislators. That was 1,045 drug-related deaths ago in Denver. Denver was trying to do something different. We are stalled at the state. Again, this year, I'm like, oh, okay, fentanyl, you want to talk about? Let's talk about overdose prevention sites. Let's talk about safe supply. They said criminalization. I said no. Um, when we talk about safe supply, too, we need to be having that conversation. We have a very unpredictable drug supply, so we need to be having conversations about heroin-assisted treatment and pharmaceutical-grade stimulants. We've never seen a community come back from fentanyl, meaning you'll get an actual heroin again or that you uh, get an actual cocaine again. This is a physician out of New York City. He said we need to play that game where we require politicians to finish every sentence denouncing supervised injection facilities with the phrase, and that is why I think injecting alone in a McDonald's bathroom is better. He's fine. We have a robust business coalition. We've got businesses that say I'm tired of being a bathroom monitor. It's very scary. We've got docs. Cops are neutral, so they're practically waving their freak flag. We've got nurses. If you've ever tried to get nurses to do anything, it's very difficult. Um, overdose is the leading cause of death of our unhoused neighbors in Denver and has been for quite a few years. So we have our organizational supporters. Treatment and recovery, love it. It's a gateway, as you can imagine. We have religious supporters. Um, it, right before COVID, the uh, Capitol Hill um, churches were unlocked. Those were one of the last unlocked bathrooms in town. So folks were actually going in and using their bathrooms. And sometimes during the week, it's just the church secretary in there by herself. So they were very conflicted if they should lock the doors or not, which was against their value system. Um, and former Colorado Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman is, was very supportive as well. This is me, your local harm reduction free questions, issues, concerns. Well, people are thirsting for that. I did not used to be a prevention gal because I feel like drugs sell themselves and drugs are fucking magical. Um, but we're doing the same thing with teens right now on drug use that we are with the sex. We're not talking about it. So if we don't talk about it, they don't do it. But actually what's happening is high risk and it's undereducated. So we have a lot of people that are dying of overdoses with the blues in the M30s, thinking they're taking a pill that's a safe supply, and we need them to have better information. <coughs> Drug Policy Alliance does have a curriculum called Safety First. I mean, part of the thing is, is I mean, I think we all had dare in here probably, right? <laughs> cops doing drug education is like nuns doing sex education. <laughs> Most cops knew they wanted to be cops from a very young age, so they didn't try anything else but alcohol. Alcohol is a safe supply. They've never had to deal with an unpredictable drug supply. Yeah. So once people didn't die of like cannabis overdoses, right, then everybody was just like, oh, none of that's very relevant. So we do need to be having real harm reduction drug education because even before fentanyl was here, we were losing, losing college freshmen every year to like one pill and alcohol, right? Even a safe supply of pill because people didn't know how to drink and things like that too. So we really do need to be having a better conversation. Right now, if I'm talking to somebody, most of the time with safe supply, it's really alcohol and cannabis. And if you want to take a pill, you kind of have to see it come out of the pill bottle. I mean, that's kind of where we're so at right now. It, I mean, it seems like, yes, we can do that education, but until there's a safe supply, 
doesn't really matter. So how do we like in are parallel? There any, are there any effort? Like how do we in parallel? We have to do it in parallel, right? We have to make sure that people. Are, and so you can you. I mean, people can do managed use all the time for fentanyl, right? The problem is, is that it's an unpredictable drug supply. So we need to be having those better conversations of like doing less, right? You need to start off slow. You can always do more. You can't do less. Much like psilocybin, right? Like we all been to the bad place. We want to do a little bit and then do a little more. That's very similar for other drugs too. And so like we can talk about safe use. We can talk about managed use because right now in a magical world, we don't have a safe supply of drugs besides cannabis and alcohol. And so we have to be, you know, once they found coca uh, uh, fentanyl and cocaine in Commerce City, which I'm a little suspicious about that story, we can all talk about that too. Um, I got a lot of cocaine users coming out of the woodwork being like, now it's in our drug supply. It's like, well, welcome to the unpredictable drug supply, just like the rest of us. You're never going to really feel confident about cocaine again. One, one word. So we have to be doing this all in parallel. But we can't be gaslit by harm reduction 1.0, which is Narcan and fentanyl testing strips. That's how they were trying to gaslight me with this legislation. I'm like, we've had Narcan since 2012 and fentanyl testing strips in 2018. You're not giving people who use drugs anything in this legislation but criminalization. They already have this stuff. You're not giving them. We have to be innovative and evidence-based and data-driven, which is harm reduction 2.0, which is overdose prevention sites and safe supply. And I know it hurts people's tummies because we've never had a good conversation about drug use in the United States ever. The war on drug users has been racist and classist. We've tried incarceration. We should still be on the apology tour for the incarceration from the 1980s, right? We've had, we've tried stigma, we've tried shame, like we've done all of that. This is a public health emergency that demands a public health approach and really working for that, yeah. What would, in a magical world, what would safe supply look like to you? How would we get So there? it's currently happening in seven countries. It would be heroin assisted treatment. So diacetyl morphine would be really tough to get, so maybe hydromorphone. Um, but even like Dilaudid and morphine uh, currently could be a possibility. Um, and then we'd have to talk about stimulants too. From those sites, that, that's where they get it, like from the actual use. Well, they would. Pr uh, yes, yes, ish. I think we'll get. I think we'll get an overdose prevention site before we get safe supply. But I think we'll be able to pilot something like potentially out of a stout street or something. It has to be NIDA approved. Um, but it's like, well, then let's write a federal grant. Like, why not? Uh, because we have to be doing something different. We're still on the worst overdose crisis we've ever been in. And again, we haven't plateaued. Like, if we were plateauing and we're like, cool, 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 shit's really popping for us, cute, 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 you know. But it's, it's, it's wild and out of control. And this drug-induced homicide piece, this mandatory treatment piece, this OD mapping piece, all that's going to do is make sure that no one calls 911. So in the time when we want to decrease overdose deaths, we believe that this is going to actually increase overdose deaths. So yes, we will take your money for the front lines because we are struggling and we're telling you what we need and they're they're telling us what they think what they think people who use drugs need while they go home and drink their safe supply of alcohol. So Lisa, with the current momentum for the decriminalization or legalization of psychedelics, any concerns or views or opinions about, about this momentum? Oh, well, it's huge. We need to be having these conversations. Just don't forget about us. The cannabis folks forgot about us. They really tried to distance themselves, right? Soft, hard, right? And I think there's some lessons to be learned from that, too. That, you know, um, people use drugs. And drugs are very magical for a lot of people. But don't, don't other some folks so that you can push forward with your drug, you know? Um, for decrim in particular with other drugs, uh, I get concerned, I mean, obviously I'm supportive of decrim of all drugs, but I'd like to get to the point with, with decrim, you still have an unpredictable drug. I mean, we do need to start having real conversations about legalization, just because like, like, a, like we've already tried the incarceration route. People are going to use drugs. We need to get to like a smarter, more pragmatic way about that. But it does help when we kind of talk about, you know, your, you know, your drug is kind of, the gateway drug for the conversation, not for the gateway drug for other stuff. And we thought we could really glom on to the cannabis folks, and the cannabis folks were very clear that they were not trying to deal with us at all and kind of left us in the dust. And so it's like, but there's more that we can be doing together. I mean, it was really interesting when the when the decrim hit at, uh, was it 301, right? But then so many folks voted against those that were unhoused under the 300, and kind of, you know, kind of that kind of, you know, conversation 
But I think we need to be having that conversation. And sometimes I feel like a lot of drug use conversation is very stalled or behind closed doors, and it's like, we need to get it out there. The only way that people are going to participate in the harm reduction movement is one conversation by one conversation. The only way that people are going to participate in your movement is one conversation by one conversation, and definitely not othering, because the more the merrier, um, which also helps normalize it, too. When we, when, we in, when we fight internally as the movement, that's what, that's what the communications director of the drug war wants. And fuck her, we hate her. <laughs> we hate her. Who is that know? person, by the way? She's terrible, I hate her. She's just out there, who knows? <laughs> She's really good. She's got a lot of that fentanyl madness out there. Katie, yes? Um, how do you feel about the upcoming ballot initiatives that uh, involve plant medicine and psychedelic exceptionalism? Um, I know you've been, yeah, you've been speaking a lot about that, but um, as far as psychedelic exceptionalism goes, what are your thoughts? Well, we're excited. Uh, you know, there was some back and forth that they were going to try to do some decrim for all drugs in Colorado, and I think there was some internal fussiness about that. Uh, I think after this, you know, we fentanyl and heroin has taken quite the brutal beating <laughs> the last six months, and they've um, they've uh, not been very supportive. Um, they, the drug, the drug warriors. Um, but you know, I mean, we it helps. It helps those conversations, right? But we want to make sure we're very clear that it's not always the soft drugs. Um, but I think you have a really good place too. Of, you know, a lot of people have used psychedelics, and a lot of people have used cannabis, and a lot of people have used alcohol. So those conversations can be had, and then you can make the leap of having these other conversations too about heroin and fentanyl and why that is. Because you know, we don't want to be othering. Um, but I think it helps the movement for sure because. You know, we're drug policy reformers, and so we owe it to each other to continue to be drug policy reformers. We need to be chipping away at archaic and racist drug policies in Colorado. It's on us. It's not on them. It's on us. And so um, I think that'll help. But don't forget about us once you win. <laughs> um, so to that, uh, I think often I, I totally agree that like splitting the psychedelic or just the drugs community general yeah. uh, is really dangerous for us, especially yeah. with our political power. But then you run into this issue where like with cannabis or very possibly with decrim nature, like people with like uh, coalitions that are like appealing to the NPR crowd and what, or have like a, a population that's more sympathetic, they'll get through and yeah. then it does seem like they just go away. Yeah. Right. And that makes it feel like a scarcity thing. And I'm curious, like what you found to help sort of like bridge so bring some more of those people into like the larger like drug policy conversation so that they don't leave. Yeah. You know I mean? Well, you know, I'm never trying to change hearts and minds in the Denver Post comment section. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a reporter? No. <laughs> um, so I do think it's those conversations and people like really talking about it because we can be very surface, you know, and um, a lot of people can't drill very deep on it too, and so I think like it, it's perfectly aligned for people for they want us in fighting, right? And so it's like we we're here for the movement for everybody, but then don't forget about everybody too. And of course, like heroin and fentanyl users are going to be last because they've been last foreverville because it's tough to talk about and it hurts our tummies. It's much easier the gateway drugs. I mean, a lot of times when I have conversations with folks. Narcan is a gateway to have, like, we can all agree people shouldn't have to have a preventable overdose, and then we can have this larger conversation. So it is tough. You know, where we, where we, I feel like we have gained a little traction is trying to get to that NPR crowd and just planting the seed. People who don't know anything about people who use drugs think they know everything about people who use drugs. So oftentimes I take people from a place of misinformation and neutral because people have to sit with it too. Yeah. And then they come back. And so, like, just being patient. You know, harm reduction isn't just for people who use drugs. It's for decision makers and you know, healthcare providers and things like that. It's like, I'm gonna meet you where you're at and we're gonna have those conversations because nobody's ever had these conversations with people, right? Everything has been scare tactic and incarceration and who cares and those and others and things. And so it hurts tummies and it's like, we have to be able to talk through it. So I don't know, we'll get there, I don't know. I don't know, we're on the same side. What the fuck does this guy do? That's what I want. Yes! 
intake diversion center too so basically it's any sort of disruptive behavior that's happening in the community which could be anything and then either you go to jail or you go to this aid center for uh, diversion services I mean they had to put money into this uh, criminalization bill for MAT services because of how many people they're going to incarcerate I mean they were talking about they're going to 380 people are going to get a felony the first year just in Denver with this uh, legislation so they're saying 3,000 statewide in the first year. So in a time when I, this is a great opportunity to expand prisons for them, um, you know, I think they've been, it's been very paternalistic with a lot of the kind of homelessness and unhoused. Um, but we also have a new mayor next year. New mayor needs new chief, new chief needs new commander. Maybe, right? Some people are getting very strategic, they're really being strategic out there and trying to get people in there too. Uh, to be more uh, hateful and punitive, if you can imagine. So, um, in a time, you know, and a lot of our folks, we share a lot of the same folks. A lot of my folks are unhoused who have a felony within seven years, violent or not, and it's very difficult to get into housing. Sometimes they're like, it wasn't even violent. I was like, it might as well have been. It's treated the exact same way. So, a lot of folks that are unhoused have these felonies. Now, when you have this felonization legislation, it means more folks are going to be felons, meaning you can't get housing or a job. And then people are like, why can't they flourish? And it's like, well, because the system is set up like that. So in a time when we should be shifting, we're doubling down on the worst ideas of the drug war, which is criminalization and incarceration. What does this guy do? This is what we need. This is the real question. <laughs> Very slide. OK, I think we're wrapping up here pretty soon. Any last burning questions? We're on the social media. This is what the kids are doing out there. It's my um, email with any questions, issues, concerns, Marty. So in Vancouver, social Portugal, they seem to be like looked at as like models. Anything we can learn from them or anything they can do better? Oh, we can learn all sorts of things. I mean, Iran and Australia do a syringe exchange in prison because they know that drugs get into prison. Colorado Department of Corrections has had a 300% increase in drug overdose deaths in the last two years, and no friends or family has been able to come in, so it's guards, obviously. But then if you talk to Department of Corrections, they're like, I think fentanyl's coming in on paper. And I'm like, I've never heard of paper fentanyl. And they're like, yeah, we don't know how it's coming in. It's like, it's guards. That's that's how it's, that's how what's happening. So there's, there's, there's uh, drugs in detoxes, jails, and prisons all over the place. You know, actually in England, They've never had more than 1% HIV positivity rate among people who inject drugs, and that came under Margaret Thatcher, old, old liberal Thatcher, um, <laughs> allowing syringe exchange because of socialized medicine. So there's a lot to be learned around the world. Overdose prevention sites are happening in 12 countries. There's a ton of them in Germany, Spain, um, Switzerland, so many places that people have just bumped into, really, um, and they're doing it the right way. Most of those countries do have socialized medicine, though, so we do have a fucked up healthcare system. I don't feel like that's like new and innovative information. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are doing it right. Doctor? <laughs> Has there been uh, any research done on these, um, these supervised centers of, like, I don't know, maybe in, in a safe environment, maybe they're more willing to talk about themselves? And yeah. Maybe even bringing you know, therapists in or whatever totally. that might be. Yep, I have a whole binder, because they've done so much research on it. It doesn't increase crime in the neighborhood. It reduces public injecting. It reduces needle litter. I mean, right now, if somebody wants to have a conversation with me about treatment, and they're in withdrawal, they have to go three blocks away to use, and then come back to talk to me about it. Well, I probably lost them by then, right? Because they can't do it on site. So it's like, I want to be able to like go, get well, come back, and let's talk about it. So there's so, there's, I, I'm a binder gal. Um, so there's so much data and research about it, that's why it's so frustrating. So sometimes I bring my binders to the legislature and I make it really weird and like, 
that make him like fall onto the table and go, oh, excuse me, with all my data. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then comps and DAs bring like a paper and they're like, we got this idea and our tummy is hurt, you know. Um, and so like that's what's really frustrating too is like it has been studied and like you know like. People don't buy, buy or sell out front because that would blow it up. They're not fucking idiots, right? Why wouldn't they buy or sell out front right now? Why wouldn't a seller stand right up front? They want to protect that area. So it's just kind of this misinformation people have about people who use drugs that's really frustrating because it's like, well, that's not our experience. Did I tell you we're an award winner? You know, um, So that's really important too. So we'll get there. We'll definitely have one in Colorado. We'll definitely have one in Denver. I just don't know how many more thousands of people have to die of a preventable overdose until we can get there. Okay, get to that bar. Get your safe supply and your consumption set. <laughs> Thanks for having me.